Hello, I'm Walter Cronkite. He only had an eighth grade education, yet for a dozen years the press referred to him as one of the most powerful people in the nation. In the darkest days of the Great Depression, President Franklin Roosevelt called on him to help save railroads, banks, farms, and businesses. When one old war loomed, the president turned to him again to help the Allied nations prepare for battle. But I first knew of him when I was growing up in Houston. It seemed like the tallest buildings in town all belonged to him. He was Jesse Holman Jones. Time magazine once reported, To many a U.S. citizen, great and small, if Jesse Jones says, Okay, okay. And Jones' crony, humorous Will Rogers, was fond of saying, I get all my money information from Jesse Jones. In one way or another, so did the rest of the nation. He's a forgotten hero from one of the most important chapters in our nation's history. Brother, can you spare a billion? The story of Jesse H. Jones. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your being here this afternoon. We're going to have a very interesting uh, discussion today with our speakers. Uh, but first, my name is Julie Olson. I'm a small business owner in the Pacific Northwest and the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. I'm a uh, big supporter of the National Infrastructure Bank. Certainly in my home state of Alaska, we've got huge infrastructure needs that need to be met. We have a, a port that handles 85% of the uh, goods that come into the state of Alaska that's in danger of failing in the next earthquake. We need affordable housing. Um, we have uh, erosion along the coast because of climate change. And each of you in your areas of, of the country are um, facing probably on a regular basis some of the, the infrastructure needs that you have in your area. And so we really hope to be able to enlighten for you today uh, how public banking could help address these needs that we have across the country. So uh, with that, we're going to go right to our um, speakers, and we're going to start with Alfeka Mutardi, who is our chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Um, and um, uh, she's uh, formerly a economist with the International Monetary Fund. I think you'll find her presentation very enlightening. And Alfeka, take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I uh, would like to open by just giving you a little background on where we are with the economy uh, and where we are with our National Infrastructure Bank proposal. Um, the, um, we have a bill in Congress to enact a public bank that is a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. And the reason, of course, we need a bank like this, uh, it will very much mirror the Reconstruction Finance Corporation uh, that came before, which was the immediate uh, preceding bank uh, that Stephen Fenberg is going to talk to you about and describe how uh, these, these are similar um, proposals. Uh, this bill in Congress uh, currently has 16 co-sponsors, 17 co-sponsors, co and we're actively looking for more. That's where all of you as a, a group, a grassroots group tuning in can help us to get this legislation moving along. Uh, but I wanted to tell you sort of where we are with the bank proposal and where we are with the economy uh, in today's world and how this can uh, fit in. So uh, obviously we've had four uh, large public banks before, four large uh, um, public banks that built most of our nation's infrastructure, starting after the American Revolutionary War and going through uh, Stevens uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Uh, and they were very successful, built most of our nation's infrastructure. They're not around anymore. They had a 20 year sunset clause in them. And but they were very successful and they ended all of their they got all the loans paid back, built big chunks of our nation's infrastructure. We want to do the same with this new National Infrastructure Bank proposal. So I just want to really quickly go over with you how this fifth proposal for a public bank works. It is modeled on Alexander Hamilton's method for capitalizing a bank by going to the private sector and asking holders of treasuries if they would like to sell in some of their treasuries into the NIB to, in exchange for preferred stock, they would pay these investors a little extra. 
and the extra stream of money for to pay that would come out of the NIB's loans with plenty of money left over to meet other operational needs. And then the bank, uh, once it's capitalized, would give out loans exactly like a commercial bank, uses the same accounting software and everything. And the secret of commercial banks is that when they create a loan and book it, they create a deposit and they're actually creating money. 95% of America's money supply was created by commercial deposit taking banks in exactly this fashion. And the NIB wouldn't be no different. And then it'll give out very low cost loans. It's a public bank. We want to keep financing costs down. And it will lend directly to state and local governments any public entity that owns a bit of public infrastructure, be it a school, a road, a bridge, uh, or even a, a transit authority can come in directly to the NIB for to request a loan. We'll cover $5 trillion in projects. We've, we've uh, scaled this bank to be large enough to cover all of our backlog of infrastructure needs as they are measured by the American Society of Civil Engineers to repair transportation systems, water systems, upgrade our electric power grid. And we added some other categories we think are critical, high-speed rail everywhere with much more rail in the transportation mix, uh, broadband, affordable housing, 7 million units targeted to the very lowest income earners who need them the most, and then some large-scale water projects to address drought where we grow half our nation's food supply. The, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed last November is actually one-tenth too small to do the whole job to meet all these projects. This is a line-by-line -line listing of what the bank will uh, cover and what the, the bipartisan law uh, also covers. If we're really serious about fixing infrastructure, we're gonna need the National Infrastructure Bank <clears throat> to complement, top up, and provide the other 90% of the money that's still missing from the picture. We think that the operations of the, of the NIB will not only fix all of our nation's infrastructure, but it'll really supercharge the American economy. How does it do that? First of all, to, to construct this new infrastructure, we're gonna create up to 25 million new great paying jobs. Uh, the legislation requires that workers be paid Davis-Bacon wages, by America only provision will stimulate American manufacturing. We can re raise GDP growth up to where it was during the average, during the period of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was 5% per year. And we can do the same again with this bank. And all this without any recourse to new federal taxes, spending, or debt deficits. And so this legislation should appeal to both Republicans, fiscal conservatives, and actually has a really good chance of getting passed. It will reduce inflation rather than add to it. Inflation, of course, is a supply demand problem uh, where the, the action of this bank will increase supplies dramatically. I'm gonna show you exactly how that'll happen. It, uh, it'll also, by, by producing more goods, it'll offset any coming recession. Economists think that we're 98% chance of going into a recession, and this, this bank can lean against that by hiring workers that are now become newly unemployed to do these uh, great paying uh, jobs. A couple of areas that uh, of emphasis to show you how it increases supplies, we want to build a complete high-speed rail network all across the country. What we know is that using rail to move goods and passengers is much more fuel efficient. We can end traffic congestion, which uses 56 super tankers of fuel a year for people sitting stopped in traffic. That'll add more to our fuel supplies, save on CO2 emission. We can, we can also address the drought crisis where we grow our nation's food. If we don't take care of that, uh, we're going to have spiking, more spiking food prices than we've seen to date. Uh, it could really get very, very serious. This is where we grow um, our fresh uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, our farmers grow their cattle. Uh, we need absolutely to get more water into these areas. We could also help low income communities. Uh, what we know is that there's a, a recent report out that says 35% of families in the United States can't make ends meet. They can't pay for their rent and their food and their daycare. Uh, they definitely need assistance. And the way the bank helps with this is it gets them into great paying jobs on the top end, increases their wages, and then it provides them with affordable housing on the other end. And this is definitely something that's built into the bank.
We think the NIB is a better way to fight inflation, save jobs, and curb on a recession. It's large enough to cover all of our infrastructure, creates millions of great family-sustaining jobs, hires people that become unemployed on account of the recession, fights against further food in inflation, uh, and solves uh, supply chain problems as well. Uh, this will prevent any meltdown, a serious meltdown in our economy, and it's something we can do right away. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfeca. I uh, really appreciate your presentation. I do want to note that we'll probably only have time at the end for a couple of questions, but I do want to encourage every, everyone, if you want more detailed information on the National Infrastructure Bank, to please visit our website, and we will have that address up later on in, the, in our presentation here today. Now, um, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, and that would be Stephen Fenberg. He is the author of the book, Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good, and also the executive producer of the film, Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? And I would just like to let everyone know that I actually read, I'm not a history person, but I read this entire book and I found it fascinating. So I would uh, really encourage everyone to uh, pick up a copy and read it. And uh, I am actually going to Texas next week where I hope to see some of the projects that Jesse Jones was able to work on and build there in Texas. So with that, I'd like to introduce Stephen Fenberg. Thank you, Julie. I'm so happy to be here and to, to basically echo what uh, Alfeca was talking about, because everything that she mentioned that the new infrastructure bank can do was done by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation during the Great Depression and World War II. Ironically, the RFC was started by a Republican president. The first alphabet agency of the New Deal was the RFC, and Herbert Hoover started it in 1932 uh, after he tried to rely on volunteerism, charity, uh, proclamations about how the economy was recovering, even though it wasn't. He realized by 1932 that the federal government was the only agency large and powerful enough to uh, address the calamity of the Great Depression. So he started the RFC in 1932 to make loans to insurance companies, banks, and railroads, thinking that would restore confidence and get the economy to turn again. It's For context, it's interesting to know that the federal budget in 1932 was $4 billion. That's not even $100 billion today. Federal government was tiny. It did not intervene like it does today. So it was really a stretch for Hoover uh, and the federal government to, to take this giant step into helping the economy through the RFC. But it was so successful. By the time Hoover left office, he had increased its lending authority to almost the size of the entire federal government. Jesse Jones was one of the original board members on the bipartisan board. And he would later say, and this is so relevant today, that if the RFC had been started in 1931 instead of 1932, and had judiciously loaned five to seven billion dollars, the worst of the Great Depression would have been avoided. And I bring this up as we continue to grapple with the role of government today. Um, when Roosevelt was inaugurated, it's, it's important to remember all the banks were closed. The economic system had completely collapsed. Unemployment was 25%. GDP had plunged by half. Stocks had lost 75% of their value. Suicide rates had tripled. It was a, a desperate, cataclysmic time, and they needed to do something different and new. So first, Roosevelt appointed Jesse Jones as chairman of the RFC because he recognized Jesse Jones's masterful use of credit and banking and knew that that was what was essential to get the frozen wheels of the economy to turn again. The first thing the RFC did was to buy preferred stock in banks, just exactly like what happened in 2008 with TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. It was modeled on what Jesse Jones called the Bank Repair Program from 1933. 
So the RFC stepped in and offered to buy the preferred stock of banks, knowing that they had to lift their capital structure in order for the banks to be able to lend again. The trouble was, though, the bankers wouldn't, wouldn't let go of the money. Once they sold their preferred stock to the government and got money for it, they sat on it because they were scared. They were shell-shocked. They didn't know what to do. And Jesse Jones and Roosevelt would say to them time and again, you must lend that money because if you don't, the RFC will step in as the lender of last resort. And that's precisely what happened. And that's when the RFC took off and did all of the things that Alfeca is talking about that an infrastructure bank could do today. The RFC through lending, not spending. And that is the critical difference here. It was a lending institution, much like the proposed infrastructure bank will be. Through lending, not spending, the RFC saved thousands upon thousands of homes, farms, banks, and businesses. It financed the development of high-speed rail, just like we need to do today. Through lending, it helped the railroads refinance their debt instead of you know, doing bailouts like we do today. It did it through long-term low interest loans. And every, all of these institutions survived. And what's remarkable about all of this is that the RFC during the worst economic calamity in our history made money for the federal government and its taxpayers while doing these vital programs to help people and businesses survive the Great Depression. One of my favorite examples and something that we can apply today to our own challenges is, the, uh, is bringing electricity to rural America through the Rural Electrification Administration. Um, in the 1930s, about 20% of the people living in rural areas had electricity. 80% of them lived in the dark. So in the 1930s, Jones and the RFC cooperated with utilities throughout the nation and helped establish electric cooperatives. And through lending, it helped them bring electricity into their areas and it comprehensively spread the uh, infrastructure that was required to have the electricity travel all around the United States, the grid, which we have great problems with right here in Texas. So it brought electricity to rural America, but it was the Great Depression and people didn't have money to buy appliances to plug into the modern age. So again, through lending, Jesse Jones and the RFC started the Electric Home Farm Administration. And the way it worked, let's say a farmer wanted to go into the main street store and buy a radio, a fan, a refrigerator, a pump. He would buy those things, take them home. The RFC would reimburse the merchant for those purchases. The electric company that was supplying the power to this new customer would put a monthly charge in the customer's bill with a little tiny bit of interest for those appliances and then forward the proceeds to the RFC. More than a million families benefited from this program. And when it was uh, abolished in 1943, because it was no longer needed, that's another nice feature of the RFC. Nothing was there in perpetuity. Once it served its useful life, it was discontinued. But anyway, uh, when it was discontinued in 1943, Jesse Jones reported about it. And he said it helped over a million families and it returned a tidy profit to the federal government. I bring this up because this is the exact strategy we could use today to help people retrofit their houses so they're storm resistant, energy efficient, and wired for the digital age. The exact same mechanism that was used in the 1930s can be used today to spread broadband access everywhere, especially to underserved areas. And these programs work. By 1936, industrial output had doubled. Detroit was churning out as many cars as it had in 1929, and unemployment had dropped by about 8%. All the while, war is spreading throughout Europe, and the United States is completely unprepared. In 1939, uh, when Germany invaded Poland, our military ranked 17th in the world in terms of its size. It's hard to believe today that that was the case. But we were able to do big things back then. So Roosevelt would always turn to Jones when he needed to do something that he couldn't get through Congress because Jones had basically his own power of the purse. The RFC had become so successful through its lending 
that it could allocate billions of dollars to do things that maybe Congress would not approve. And the public was completely opposed to intervention unless the United States was directly attacked. Neutrality acts prevented Roosevelt from sending arms to warring nations. So he turned to Jesse Jones and the RFC. We got to do something. This is in 1940, 18 months before the attacks on Pearl Harbor. So Jesse Jones then shifted focus from domestic economics to global defense and started building through the RFC these massive factories that would manufacture the trucks, the airplanes, the ships, the tanks that were required to fight and win World War II. It was a massive investment by the federal government to, and it was comprehensive. I mean, they didn't just build these things, they started uh, schools to train aviators to fly the airplanes. They created manufacturing of uh, parachutes and uh, high octane gas to fuel the airplanes. Everything they did was comprehensive. And again, and I say these things because when we were first battling COVID and I kept thinking, geez, it's a shame we don't have something like the RFC that can orchestrate the entire effort and supply everything that we need to effectively combat that pandemic. We could do the same thing with our supply shortages today, with chips, with rare earth materials. There's so many applications. If we look at what the RFC did so successfully back in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, through a new infrastructure bank, we can do the same thing. I think one of the most amazing things the RFC did, did during World War II is that it developed synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production. And if it had not made that uh, investment and orchestrated it, they, they called, got the corporations, universities, scientists to collaborate, sit down, pool patents, figure out how to do this. If they had not done that, the Allied forces would have been stuck in place and unable to fight because the Japanese took our supply of natural rubber in the Pacific Ocean, just as these new synthetic rubber plants were coming online. So this is all to say, great monumental things were once done by our federal government and the people of the United States. And the ingredient to all of this is to embrace our government as something patriotic and something, something great that we can all support. Or as Jesse Jones said in 1937 about economic recovery, it cannot be achieved if we allow ourselves to believe that our government is our enemy. It's not. It is the mechanism we have to do great things to restore our nation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, we are going to go to Ellen Brown. She is the author of the book Web of Debt, as well as other books and articles, and is the founder and chair of the Public Banking Institute. In that role, she has worked with uh, various communities and states around the country uh, to talk about public banking and uh, how states might um, set up public banks to uh, meet needs in those particular areas. So Ellen, uh, you've got the floor. We need an RFC style budget workaround today. We've had two major infrastructure bills passed in the last year, the 2021 bipartisan infrastructure law, but it mainly addressed highway programs and the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022, but it mainly addressed uh, energy security and climate change. So as Becca points out, we still have major infrastructure, critical infrastructure that needs to be built. I mean, I'm in Los Angeles, so one thing is water out here. We're gonna, we're gonna run out of water for our food needs and for people. Um, but of course, Congress has essentially said they're done appropriating for now. Uh, no, they're not going to be issuing any more money. So what do we do? Uh, Chester Morrow, former secretary of the Board of Governors of the Fed, said of the RFC, it became apparent almost immediately to many congressmen and senators that here was a device which would enable them to provide for activities that they favored for which government funds would be required, but without any apparent increase appropriations. There need be no more appropriations and its activities could be enlarged indefinitely as they were um, almost 
Well, anyway, they were <laughs> greatly. Um, so we have a more recent model actually than the RFC and that's the Japan Post Bank, which did the same thing. Japan, Japan Post Bank is the third largest depository bank in the world, it used to be the first largest. It's been called Japan's second budget because it takes in the deposits of the Japanese people. So it's a huge bank. It's got a huge liquidity um, access to liquidity. And then it, rather than making loans, it invests in government bonds. So this is funding for the government where they don't have to go to, to their legislature all the time. Um, and currently Japan's debt to GDP ratio is 266%. That's the highest of any developed country. Yet Japan is still the world's largest creditor nation, which means that more money is owed to Japan than to any other country. So how is that even possible? It's because Japan's debt is owed to the Japanese people themselves. So it's internal. It's a, the Japan Post Bank obviously is publicly owned. Well, it's now like half publicly owned because they had to sell off part of it to pay for Fukushima. But anyway, it's a great model it, and it worked and um, shows that we could do that today. We also had a, a postal banking system from 1911 to 67, which was very popular. It's a big, obviously big publicly owned bank. Um, people rushed to the postal banks because the uh, commercial banks were bankrupt. So they pulled their money out, put them in the postal bank. They got 2% interest and uh, they had better hours than, the, than banking hours. And in July 2013, I wrote an article about this a long time ago, but uh, the, uh, the president of the National Association of Letter Carriers proposed that we could do the same thing with our um, post, post office and turn it into a national infrastructure bank, funding it in the same way that the Japanese did. It wouldn't cost the government anything and it would be a form, source of um, income for the post office, which as we know is on the verge of bankruptcy. That didn't happen, obviously, but the fact that the Japanese have done it just shows that it's a, it's a viable model. Uh, today, the stellar model for infrastructure is China, which went from one of the poorest countries in the world to global economic powerhouse in four de decades. Among other things, they built 12,000 miles of high-speed rail in a decade. I mean, they're up to more than 12,000 miles now, but the fact that they did that in a mere 10 years and the world's largest dam and power station. So how did they do it? The government owns 80% of Chinese banking assets, including three massive development banks. So the government, of, so they make loans to, to fund the infrastructure project and then the fees from whatever they built pay back the loans. So fees from electricity from the dam or fees from uh, the rail. And even this year, which we're in a global recession at best, maybe Amy for depression, we hope not. Um, China is still forging ahead with development. Uh, the growth increased 15% year over year as of July 2022. In June, they began nearly 4,000 new large projects across the, front, the country, and they're funding it mostly with credit lines from their three big policy banks and, and partly from financial bonds and other instruments. Uh, Professor Richard Werner is a, a uh, one of the stars in, our, in the public banking movement. He's a professor in the UK and he's from Germany. So Germany is his favorite model. But he notes that besides having these big infrastructure banks, China has a broad network of lo local banks which work with the infrastructure banks. So they know the local economy, know the local businesses, and they're willing to take risks because of the backing of big national government banks. Uh, Germany's development bank KFW also works with the local public banks. Those are the Sparkheads and banks. And uh, KFW provided 1% loans to small businesses during the pandemic and assumes a large part of the risk of business loans for investment or working capital. The US, however, has more local banks than any other country in the world. What we don't have is a national coordin coordinating bank for infrastructure and development and the NIV HR 3239 could provide that. Today, the Fed is fighting inflation with quantitative easing, but it's not working. Inflation is actually going up according to its favorite inflation gauge, which is the personal consumption expenditures. And why is that? It's because if you raise the interest rates on producers, they're going to have to raise their prices to cover their costs. Um, there are two types of inflation, cost push and demand pull, and the Fed is operating as if this were 
um, demand pull, meaning like too much money slashing around in the economy competing for goods, but it's actually not enough goods. Or in fact, retailers, I guess, are overstocked now because people aren't spending like they were. They're worried about recession, but they're over, overstocked with non-essentials. But where the crunch still is, is with the key raw materials, the energy, fertilizer, grains, rare metals, et cetera. So in order to solve um, cost push inflation, you've got to get your costs down, which means uh, get supply up. And that's what the National Infrastructure Bank would do. And in fact, uh, the model of the HR 3339 is actually better or could do more than the Reconstruction Finance Corporation because it's proposed to be a depository bank. So depository banks, if you're just a revolving fund, you can only you get the money, you lend it out, it comes back, you lend it again. But a bank is allowed to leverage its capital at 10 to 1. So if you have a dollar in capital, you can make $10 in loan. You still have to cover those loans as the money goes out with liquidity. But if you're a depository bank, you can get it from the from your depositors, and I don't. I you probably noticed you're you're not making anything like the interest rate on your deposits that the bank is making on loans. So deposits are still quite cheap for banks, or you could issue or the NIB could issue bonds the same as the um, Reconstruction Finance Corporation did, and then for cities that don't have the, like revenues to repay the loans. They can do it with revenue bonds, which is what happened during the, during the 1930s, where the revenue from the thing that's built would pay off the loan. So that's what the Chinese do as well. So, for example, if you built some sort of energy thing that produced energy, the, the energy fees would pay back the loan. So we can rebuild the country and create a 21st century renaissance with a national infrastructure bank. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ellen. We really appreciate your presentation. And so at this time, I'd like to open up the floor for questions. And uh, please raise your hand um, if you've uh, got a question. So I think we'll start with Roger Meadows. You're muted. There we go. Hey, a couple, uh, three quick questions, real quick. Um, one, why did the RFC expire? Why, why did it just go away? There's the Republican <laughs> government. Stephen. You want me to answer that? Yeah, that'd be great. Go for it, Stephen. Okay. So as far as Jesse Jones was concerned, I had said earlier about, you know, the things were disbanded once they had uh, uh, extended their useful life. And Jesse Jones thought about that, about the RFC. It had done what it had it was needed to be done. Once he was no longer in charge of it, uh, the loans that it started to make were very dubious and they were not good ones. He was very judicious about protecting the American taxpayer. He made money throughout the, uh, the Great Depression. World War II was a different story. It was a different intent altogether. But after World War II was over, the, the RFC and Jesse Jones had started to plan on what they call reconversion because they owned the majority of the industrial base by then. For instance, they had invested 10 times more in aviation than the industry had invested in itself during its whole lifetime. But even before the end of World War II, they started planning on what they called reconversion because they had built this massive industrial base, but they leased it to corporations to operate. And that's that's an and I'm sorry to go off on this tangent, but that's such an interesting point because so often when we want to use government to do something, it's they they say that's socialism. Well, you know, how do they think World War II was won? The federal government owned the means of production and leased it to corporations to operate. But my point is they very consciously um, affected reconversion. They sold all of that industrial base to the private sector, which expanded the United States industrial base and grew the middle class after the end of the war. Uh, the RFC actually evolved in the Small Business Administration. And so that's, that is, you know, the result of the RFC is now the Small Business mm -hmm. Administration. But again, the point I made is, we don't let government do what it can do because we think it's our enemy and it's not. So I would say if we could embrace the SBA, the Small Business Administration or a new RFC, we'd be well ahead of the game. 
which kind of goes into my second question about worker cooperatives. They should definitely be have some type of, uh, if there's going to be a public private partnership or anything like that, it should, we should prioritize co-op businesses because we've seen what a lot of these lately, I mean, back then it was different. There was a lot more regulations on, on big business and all that. But since then, every time we have these corporate government partnerships, they end up fleecing the government and giving us crappy service. So I figured if, if somehow we can have it where the, the, the bank, the, the NIB prioritizes partnering with co-op businesses, worker cooperatives, it would uh, be a lot uh, you know, better or whatever the case is. Uh, Alfaka, can you address that? Um, uh, certainly the legislation that we have pending talks about PPPs, but what about co-ops? Absolutely, we would support co-ops because we think of them as a public entity. So they're like a almost like a transportation authority. These are these are uh, they own uh, a bit of public infrastructure, like an electricity company, a broadband company, whatever it is, and uh, they're owned by the, the 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 people that use the services themselves. And we think of them as a public entity. We would support them and expand them as well. Our overall emphasis of the bank is to keep public infrastructure in public hands. We, we can accommodate a P3 project like an airport refurbishment or a port refurbishment, but any, any current infrastructure that is publicly owned, we wanna maintain it as publicly owned. And we also think there's a great case for doing that. Uh, first of all, the financing costs and the administration are much lower. Uh, there's not a uh, um, conflict of interest where the pi private entity is trying to extract profits. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we, that's it's a public institution. And uh, we think that also they, they don't even, they're supposed to uh, have taken over projects because they're supposed to be better managers, but the apparent, <laughs> uh, the appearance is that they are, they don't really manage that well. We can do a lot of economies of scale and help with engineering of projects and standardization. This is something that's really needed, especially in the rail transportation area uh, and the bank can help with that, which will bring down costs. So altogether, and we think that oh, the lesson of four national infrastructure banks across our history, where they, for the most part, had a 20-year sunset clause in them, that's why they went away, the lesson is that we've learned is that we need a permanent institution, uh, right? For long-term financing of infrastructure, we're, after the, this 10-year uh, improvements are over, we'll have the next generation of infrastructure that we have to uh, rebuild and keep up. So we really need a, budgets are not working for that. We need a full-time institution to work on infrastructure. And the last question, can it replace the Federal Reserve Bank? Yeah, the mandate, it's a great question. The mandate of the Federal Reserve uh, is very different from what we want to do. The Federal Reserve is a bank for a central bank for banks. And so what it does is it provides the liquidity for banks, and then they go and they lend according to what they think is the, in their business interest. Lately, they have not been lending into the real sector. They've been lending into the financial sector. And mm -hmm. as, that's one of the reasons our infrastructure has, they could have lent all this time to rebuild infrastructure. They simply haven't been able to do it. Uh, and that that just goes to show you that the, their, their procedures would go on as before. We need a dedicated institution just for infrastructure that will steer and mobilize the credit into this one area, which has not happened either through the Federal Reserve or through budgets. Thank you, Alfaka. Okay, we've got a lot of hands up. So we're really gonna to try to keep moving along here so we can get everyone's questions answered. So next we're gonna go with Erin Rosillo. Erin? Um, hi, I uh, heard you mention, or somebody mentioned that there is current legislation pending right now. Yes. And uh, I was wondering, is that uh, bipartisan uh, with the sponsorship of that? And do you think it'll make it to the floor this year? Uh, Alfaka, do you wanna take that question briefly? Yes, uh, so the bill is HR 3339. Um, you can look it up on uh, congress.gov. Uh, it has got 17 co-sponsors the, at the moment. Uh, uh, they're all Democrat, but we are actively looking for Republicans. This infrastructure, this bill is not just 
bipartisan, but it's almost nonpartisan. Every single jurisdiction needs infrastructure, and this is a way to finance this without having to go to the budget or increasing debt. Uh, so you could help uh, uh, as a, as the, this is a grassroots effort to push it, uh, you can call your congressman and ask them to pass HR three 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 nine. Thanks. And, and can I okay. add a little something to that sure. Sure. Uh, you know, as as a historic precedent. The RFC was embraced by Republicans and Democrats, conservatives, liberals. It was nonpartisan. The RFC made loans in every congressional district in the United States. And, you know, it was used by the nation to rebuild itself and then to become the arsenal of democracy during World War II. So there's the precedent. It's happened before. It can happen again. Thank you. Uh, next, I want to go uh, with a uh, participant from my home state of Alaska. This is a guy who had worked on establishing a state bank, a public bank in Alaska. John Nelson. John, do you have a question? Yeah, Julie, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, being involved in this. Um, question on the uh, raising the capital requirements for uh, lending of 10 to 1 uh, to preserve liquidity and stability. Can you uh, maybe speak a little bit to that? Maybe Dr. Brown or somebody else? Sorry, oh. I'm not understanding the question. Well, the, the reserve limits for lending out of 10 to 1, I mean, if we if the bank brings in one dollar and they can turn around and loan out 90 cents on that dollar. Uh, that's part of what got us into the 0809 financial services meltdown was because of illiquidity. Well, um, the capital, of course, will come from the idea is that we'll take bonds and give them in return um, preferred stock, which is non voting stock. So it's it'll still be a public institution plus 2% interest, but you can divide that 2% by 10. I mean, if you're making 10 times as many loans as capital, then that's only 0.2% for each of those loans. Anyway, so, so then the idea is to make cheap loans. So you do have to pull the liquidity from somewhere. The reason the fractional reserve work, it's worked for hundreds of years. And the reason is that I mean, it goes back to the goldsmiths of the 17th century who figured out that people preferred to leave their gold with the goldsmiths. They didn't want to carry it around. So most depositors leave their money in the bank and people only pull it out 10% of the time. And that's why it works for the liquidity is what you have to pull reserves, you know, bank reserves from one bank to another if you're moving or else you have to pull out actual printed Federal Reserve notes if somebody wants to withdraw cash or if they write a check or use a credit card, then it transfers from one bank to another and you've got to move Federal Reserve. It's quite complicated. <laughs> but anyway, so we presume it'll work like any other bank. Uh, but if it doesn't, if we don't have enough deposits, let's say, I mean, I think it would be ideal if we actually had a had a postal bank that uh, took in, I mean, we need a postal bank or we need a public bank that's national of that sort. Um, if, if we took in public deposits, we could, we could easily come up with the liquidity. But if that doesn't work, we can issue bonds, which is exactly what the, the RFC did. And if you issue bonds, it's going to be one to one, I guess, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ellen. Great. Appreciate appreciate that answer. I'm going to go uh, to another one of our callers. Joe uh, Polito has had his hand up for a while. Joe. Uh, great presentations, everybody. Um, I have a kind of a two part question for Alfeca and perhaps Stephen. Um, how, you know, $5 trillion is a lot of money. Um, over what time period do you see all of those projects uh, initiated and completed? And and both of you, uh, and Ellen just talked about it, where will the money come from? For example, some people have said the central bank could buy perpetual bonds from such a bank. Um, uh, you know, what are there are alternative finance methods? Thanks. Alfeca? Okay, uh, so the, the great questions. Uh, the time period, uh, we, we're really using the uh, expertise of the American Society of Civil Engineers in their 2021 report card, who say that when we give you a projection of how much money is needed, it's how much we need to spend over the next 10 years. 
So we dr drop that into our bill and our bank. Uh, and uh, what we're planning on is spending this $5 trillion over a 10-year period. And we're going to start with the shovel-ready projects that are ready to go. This is the long list of projects that each state and municipality has had on its books, but hasn't been able to get financing for. And then we can move into the more complicated projects uh, like building a high-speed rail system. And then the question is, where do the dollars come from? And uh, this is a really hard concept for most people to wrap their head around. It's a little secret of banks, but the secret of banks is that we don't we can we need money to capitalize it, and the capitalization money is not used in any way. It's not lent out. It sits on the books and it acts like a rainy day fund. But it's actually the banking process of taking in deposits and then using 90% of those deposits to give out on a loan. And then it causes this fractional reserve money creation. But the, the basic bottom line is whenever a bank books a loan, it adds to the money supply, the amount of that loan, and then uses the cash on hand to move it through the banking system. So it's a feature of deposit taking banks that they can create money uh, for the loans that they're giving out. And this is no different. If you're interested in a write-up on our webpage, uh, there's a, a document on this, how the NIB creates and makes money. And I'll add something again from historic perspective. The RFC was so successful in its lending programs, even though they were long-term low interest loans, there were so many of them that the a lot of cash came into the RFC so much so, so much was was profit from the interest on the loans and the dividends from the banks that they were paying, that the RFC was not only able to uh, implement its own programs, it also supplied money to the spending programs, the, the PWA, the WPA, the RFC funded those from its profits on its loans and dividends. So there is historic precedent for all of this. All we have to do is look back a little bit into history to see how it was done, and we can use that as a model for today. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks, Stephen. My pleasure. Um, okay, our next um, uh, questioner is Janice Richards. Janice, you've got your hand up. Do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Hi, Dr. Fenberg. I'm in Houston also. Nice <laughs> to I am supporting a, a group that I've been studying for the last five years called Solutionary Rail out of Vashon Island, Seattle. And they have a plan for a national electrified rail system uh, that works on existing rails to start with, which I find practical. It avoids the whole issue of uh, eminent domaining and going through all of the initial process that's already been done. And the process would take place by nationalizing existing rail, which is failing anyway from a capitalist point of view and compensating them for the nationalization and then just going with the system that they have and growing that. Of course, adding uh, high speed to that could be fine, but it's a different gauge if I understand the technical aspects. So I just wanted to uh, give a shout out for the solutionary rail system and what a great job they've done. And I hope we are taking a look at their system as well. Thank you, Janice. That's very interesting. We've met with the Cascadia rail people in the Pacific Northwest several times. And of course, they're advocating for high-speed rail in that area that would go up and down uh, the West Coast from uh, between Portland and potentially Vancouver, British Columbia. But solutionary rail, we'll have to add that to our list. I'm not sure that we've had any contact with them, but thank you so much for um, educating us. Okay, uh, our next person is Daniel Pelagero. You've got your hand up, Daniel. Yes, um, thank you everyone for the presentations. The information has been really illuminating. Um, also, I think a term that at least the House Financial Services Committee has been responding to instead of nonpartisan has been pre-partisan of late. I think we can thank crypto for that. Um, the uh, question I have is, so earlier was brought up during the Q&A that um, the, uh, the an NIB is essentially, it's not intended for any uh, private use. But what I'm thinking about now the technology piece of the FISs, the Fiserv's, the Jack Henry's, or even some of the newer fintechs that are going to be providing the ledgering systems, uh, is the intention for uh, the NIB to also be using publicly built infrastructure, or is it going to have to leverage things built on Amazon or Google's cloud as well? 
are you are you speaking of um, uh, uh, IT technology or hard infrastructure? It's the infrastructure that actually powers the bank. So it would be the bank's IT, but ultimately oh, the okay, tools okay. and the things the bank itself would use. Right. Uh, well, we envisage this as a bank and gives out loans that it would sort of use something like standard banking software. Uh, it would have a, 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 a an IT component so that people can bank electronically. Uh, and uh, we could share presence with uh, local banks to have storefronts where, um, you know, entities could come in to request loans. But on the IT side, uh, it, it would probably operate like a standard bank. I, and I then you understand. asked about private, you asked about is it intended for private use? There is a clause, even though we think we envisage that 99% of the loans would go to public entities that own public infrastructure, there is a bottleneck clause in there uh, that if the private sector is not producing something that is needed for construction input or um, you know chips or um, transformers or anything like that that uh, the private sector would produce, then this this bank could step in and give a loan. This was uh, again the very much of the model of the RFC to solve you know supply chain bottlenecks and, and that kind of thing because we have this Buy America clause in there. I, I do want to say that um, um, initially we had talked about having multiple uh, physical office locations for a national infrastructure bank, but many banking experts that we've consulted with have felt that that's really not necessary because. Uh, we have the internet and so many people are used to working remotely and um, we, in order to keep our rates as low as possible, we want to keep our expenses as low as possible for an actual national infrastructure bank. So um, this is so exactly, this is exactly kind of what I'm hitting on. It also touches on the timing question from earlier yeah. because we don't have national data centers that people are building like tools on like Netflix is built on in Amazon data centers there's a lot of uh like of these tech companies and banks are migrating over to these uh to this exact part of the supply chain and that's why I'm wondering where does that fit it, both yeah. within the infrastructure sure. that would be funded as well as what the bank itself would that's, intend on using. That's all uh, to be determined and we've actually had some conversations with SAP I don't know if you know who that is the big you know software company that's interested in providing a custom solution, but that's all down the road. But at this point, um, I would like to go back to this question about the um, uh, um, the electric trains running on existing rail structure. And I do wanna point out, we have an expert uh, on the line, also a member of the board of the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition, Stan Forzak, who um, spent much of his career working for Amtrak. Stan, would you like to weigh in on this whole question about running electric trains on existing um, rail lines? Would that work? Julie, that would work for me. And thanks a lot for asking. Uh, the question that you posed, Sarah, is very interesting. Uh, I will tell you that it's, was uh, it was proposed about 45, no, I'm going to say 45. Yeah, about 45 years ago, it was posed to build an electric railroad uh, from east to west coast using existing right of way. Uh, the gauges are similar, so that's not a problem. The problem is the fact that they're owned by different railroads. You'd have to create a, yeah, a situation of eminent domain for you to take it all over and then utilize that uh, for um, high-speed rail. And I'm assuming your group is thinking about building it above 165 miles an hour, uh, which would mean that fencing would have to be created from one side of the United States to the other side of the United States. Electric power would have to be brought in, and there's a problem there in that, although the country runs on 60 hertz power, there are sections of uh, uh, the United States, depending on what, what, uh, what horizontal access you want to be on, there are places within the country where you might not be able to have enough 60 Hertz power to power those trains. So then therefore you've got to experiment with a different Hertz, which is exactly what Amtrak did and it remains at 25 hertz rather than 60 hertz. You would have to do that. 
You also have to go to the manufacturers of the trains because you want to see which train you want to use and could they take a frequency change. So there are a lot of problems associated with using existing infrastructure and putting a, a train on there. Julie was so kind to mention the fact that uh, in the, uh, the Northwest, uh, they're, they're, they're working on the experimenting with hydrogen, which is not going to be 165 miles an hour. It'll be something smaller than that, but it was, still will be high-speed rail. High-speed rail is anything above 110 miles an hour. There's a organization in um, uh, Wisconsin that is currently working on a rail system coming out of Chicago, going up to Milwaukee, uh, Kenosha, Racine, uh, Waukesha, uh, for a commuter rail system, which is going to be a high-speed rail. They're betwixt and between, between hydrogen and electric. But I can tell you, it takes a long time to build what you think you have. East-West East -west Coast train service, electricity with no electricity now is not a 10 year project. It is more like a 15 to 22 year old, uh, 22 year project. It's something that's pretty large, not to say that the bank can't finance it, uh, but it's a very large project. I commend you and the group you're working with because it is something that should be done. I've spoken many times to people that want to put in rail and electricity is the best way to do it. The question is, do we have the time, the fortitude and the money to do it? Julia, if I may, I would love to just ask Stephen one question. Sure. Steve. I can answer it. <laughs> okay. Another great presentation. And I keep meaning to ask you this question. Uh, we know what the RFC did. We know everything that was done to build up the infrastructure and create all of these programs in the United States. Today's world is a little bit different. There's a lot of regulatory bodies. There's a lot of agencies. Would the RFC be able to do what it did in today's world, knowing that all the price tags are vastly increasing because of all the interference of the regulatory bodies? Um, I don't see that as a blockade. As I said earlier, what I think is the most daunting challenge is embracing the power of good government. It is no longer part of our value to look at our government and, and you know, be patriotic about it. Uh, I think any of those regulatory hurdles could be overcome if the agency is independent as the RFC was. It was basically, they called it the fourth branch of government, uh, but it was essential, it was needed, it had to be there. If the RFC hadn't existed, I don't know what would have happened during the Great Depression and certainly during the mobilization for World War II because the RFC basically orchestrated the militarization of industry. It was essential. So I think, yes, it can overcome regulatory hurdles, but can it overcome our attitude about government today? I would like to think it could. I hope that answers your question. That answers my question, and I agree with you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay, uh, Sarah Manning has had her hand up for a while. Sarah, do you have a question? Um, actually, I think Brittany has had her hand up longer. Okay. Um, Brittany, do you have a question for our speakers? Um, I have a suggestion. I have a... Um, Questions for uh, for for all our speak for all the speakers. Um, is it impossible that um, that that if you could um, hire a uh, uh, someone to to work on an infrastructure bill and and whatnot um, and if, if, if so, um, how often are they going to work for work with the um, work the, 
the, the infrastructure bill? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I think Alfeca could answer that, but um, Alfeca, why don't you go ahead and, and uh, take a stab at answering that question. How did that bill that we had on Congress get drafted? <laughs> By volunteers. Okay. Uh, it, it, this has been a grassroots, wonderful, wonderful, hands-on effort across the nation. But uh, what I would say, Brittany, right now is we don't have any paid staff. We uh, rub two pennies together just to pay for our advertising and our internet connection and things like that. And all of this is volunteer work. Um, so we can uh, use you at a volunteer level if you want to, you know, promote the uh, bill in wherever it is you live and call your member of Congress. And uh, for the most part, this has been a, a, the, the kinds of volunteers that have worked on this so far have been legislators who know there's not enough money for them to build their infrastructure. It has been uh, local labor unions. It has been um, um, uh, activist groups uh, who are concerned about either the environment or low wages for people or whatever, uh, people that know, know we need affordable housing, all of them have pitched in. And this has really been, uh, we've added so many of our co-sponsors in the last six months, and we, we have an all out full press court effort to add more uh, 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 co-sponsors to our bill. That's our biggest uh, pressing um, objective right now. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks, so much. Uh, I do want to say that um, um, on one of our most recent webinars, we actually had a caller who had a, a lot of expertise in how to write by American provisions into legislation so that they could be as effective as possible. So we were ha very happy to get the input from this uh, person with expertise in that area. And so certainly if anybody else on the call um, has any uh, comments or questions or information you'd like to send in that might help us, um, make changes or do editing to the legislation, that would be great. Um, it has been introduced into the last two sessions of Congress. And of course, it's going to have to be reintroduced again in this next upcoming session. Is that correct, Alfaka? Yes. So, um, and so, of course, as we go along, there are modifications and such that are, are made to that legislation. Okay, now we're going to be wrapping up here in a few minutes. So now we're going to go to Sarah. Do you have a question for us? Um, actually, I have a comment. I'm a longtime NIB supporter, live in New Mexico, also a supporter of a public bank for New Mexico. And I think the comments about good government and trusting our government are really uh, pertinent. But the, just want to make clear that the National Infrastructure Bank would primarily be lending to public entities. So because those are the entities that handle the build infrastructure. So it'd be primarily lending to banks, excuse me, not to banks, but to counties, to cities, to states, to um, uh, multi-state cooperatives along that level. The other thing that's really important is that this bill does not have a sunset clause, which means that after 10 years, and a lot of these projects are going to be halfway through and some costs will have gone up, there is still going to be more money for new projects and it will continue. So if we come up with, a, we, you know, we have such a backlog that we get through our emergency list, we get everything on the emergency list going and then the secondary or tertiary needs come up and there's gonna be enough money to fund those as well. That's a huge, deal and a, a vehicle for trust in our government that they would be able to do this. Some legislators are going to have a problem because one of the things that gives legislators powers is the ability to bring home federal money to be spent in their local districts. Um, but this would be a way for them to go far beyond that. And I really think this is an important bill to support. So it's uh, get your people in every state you're in uh, to call up your legislators and get them to support this bill, please. We need it. We need it in New Mexico and we need it in your state. Thank you, Sarah. Really appreciate it. Um, New Mexico has really been the people that are championing the National Infrastructure Bank. And I do believe they've got two of their three uh, Congress people are already signed on as co-sponsors. So thank you so much for all your support. We really appreciate it. 
Okay, um, briefly, Ruth Fruland, do you have a question? You're muted. Okay, um, well, I had uh, two, um, but let me start with one that's just a strategy thing. Um, with respect to getting bankers, like community bankers, local bankers uh, on the side, yeah, I see Sarah. It, so the question is, do we waste our time doing that or is it worth uh, spending some time trying to um, get uh, some of them behind us? I, 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 again, I'll, I'll second, you can probably speak to that better, but I just wanna say again, from history, the RFC always tried to partner with the private sector first. It always gave them first choice to do what needed to be done. So oftentimes the private sector, whether it was a bank or a, a, some kind of a store, they would partner if they could. But sometimes the issue was so large that only the government could handle it. But from a historic precedent, the RFC always gave the private sector first chance to respond if it could not or would not, then it stepped in. Thank you, Stephen. We certainly don't want the banking lobby to go up against our bill. So we are trying to be cooperative with that industry. Uh, Ruth, did you have another question? Did you have a two-parter? Uh, no, that's, that's fine. That was All good. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you. And so I think we're coming to the end of our uh, time. So we're gonna go back to Roger. We're gonna allow him to have a fourth question in addition to the three he already asked. <laughs> yes, um, so that part where you said um, made in America or something like yeah. that, by American. Uh, by American. Well, that would be perfect for a worker cooperative because, you know, the owners live in America. <laughs> yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I mean, that's a very important provision of the legislation. And so um, with as with any legislation, the way you write it is extremely important. And so certainly we're open to advice from folks who have uh, been there and been involved in those Buy America provisions to make sure we have that written as well as possible into the legislation. And you said we could go somewhere to to add some comments. Well, that... well we appreciate uh, any of your comments. So, um, well, you know, uh, we would like you all, anybody on the call, to send in your comments into our organization. And, right, to improve the bill, you said, something like that. Right. Oh, yeah, just, yeah. So if you have any ideas, you know, please let us know. The, um, the text of the legislation, as uh, Alfeca already mentioned, is at where, Alfeca? Congress.gov. Congress Congress.gov. You'll be search, able to look for up. HR 3339. Yeah. And it's a, a pretty extensive um, bill. It's, what, 80 pages long or something like that? So, I mean, there's big, a lot big of... double spacing, not some... Okay. Not but, you know, it's, you know, there's some information. It's, and um, so certainly we would encourage everyone to take a look at the legislation. If you have any ideas or thoughts about how it might be improved or things we should add, we're certainly in interested in hearing about that. So where do we send it to? Like your email? Um, uh, info at nibcoalition.com. We're, we're going to put up our contact information now. There we go. So uh, there's our website. So I'd like to encourage everyone to visit our website. We have a Facebook page. We have a Twitter handle and email. And so certainly feel free to email into our organization uh, and we will get back to you. If anyone on the call is interested in setting up additional Zoom meetings for your neighbors, your friends, your uh, local city council, your congressperson, we are happy to work with you to uh, raise visibility and awareness about the National Infrastructure Bank in your area. So uh, we would appreciate the opportunity to work with you. And finally, please call your member of Congress and ask them to support the National Infrastructure Bank. And there's the, the general number um, for that. Um, we are having another Zoom meeting uh, coming up October 27th. Um, and what we try to do is have uh, uh, interesting, uh, educated um, speakers um, that are able to address your questions and really explore some of these other ideas about public banking and how it can benefit our country. What's the Twitter so, again? I'm sorry. Um, can we put up the slide again with sorry. the Twitter? The email address? Yeah, I got the email address. Twitter. There we go. Oh, Coalition. Oh, NIB. Coalition, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, good. All right. 
Well, thanks everyone for um, being here today. We really appreciate it. We are have come to the end of our allotted time. And so uh, thank you, appreciate your attention. And uh, we hope to see you on some of our future webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you Bye very guys. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.